Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the chairperson for these sessions, and my name is Yong Hye Baek, currently working at Dongguk University Medical Center, Korea. And my core chairperson for today is Dr. Ji Young An, working at Samsung Medical Center, Korea. The title of this session is Non-Surgical Treatment for Leakage or Fistula in Upper GI Tract. Four presenter has prepared for these sessions, and I will take charge of the first two presentations. And Dr. Ahn will be take charge of the last and wrap up this session. Now, I would like to expand the process of the session. After each speaker's video stream, we will have a question and answer time with the speakers. If you have any question about the presentations, please click chat on the right side of the video screen and write down your question. If your question and are picked, you can earn Congress points. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Yoon, and his presentation is entitled Surgeon's View for the Development of Anastomic Leakage of Fistula After Gastric Surgery. To introduce him briefly, he graduated Gemyang University in 1999, trained Samsung Medical Center until 2004 and currently work at DHS Medical Center. Please stream the first speaker's presentation. This is Ogun Yoon in VHS Medical Center. It's a pity that we are not able to get together and I hope these restrictions would be released sooner or later. Before the next topic, about the management of anastomotic leakage, we review the surgeon's general view for the anastomotic leakage after gastric cancer surgery. I have no personal or financial interest to declare. Anastomotic leakage after surgery as the most troublesome complication after gastrectomy. Among them, the leakage of esophageal jejunostomy and duodenal stump are more common than other gastrointestinal leakage. Many articles reported the prevalence of esophageal jejunal anastomotic leakage is 2.1 to 14.6%. But recent Asian studies reported 1.7 to 5.7%. The prevalence of leakage in duodenal stump and gastrointestinal anastomosis are 1.6 to 5% and under the 2% respectively. But most articles were small population-based or retrospective studies. So the prevalence was very variable. Recent large population study in Severance Hospital showed the prevalence of leakage according to the site. This study reported 1.5% among the 14,000 cases. The prevalence of the leakage in gastrointestinal, duodenal stump, and esophageal jejunal stomy site were less than 1%, around 1%, and 2.4% respectively. Devascularization, inflammation, local hematoma, neoplastic environment, and postoperative distension near anastomosis are pathogenesis of leakage. The prevalence varies depending on the site. As seen before, esophageal jejunostomy site was the most frequent leakage site. Usually, shiroja layer holds the suture most strongly, so esophagus and rectum below peritoneal reflection don't have shiroja could be vulnerable to leakage compared to the other sites. In addition, 
esophagus has less vascular distribution and need more healing time compared to other sites. The risk factors of leakage except technical problem are sepsis, anemia, elderly, malnutrition, sarcopenia, obesity, high ASA score, previous chemotherapy or radiotherapy, smoking, alcohol, steroid, postoperative NCs, and advanced malignancy. In case of localized peritonitis, patient could complain no symptom. But most patients complain postoperative abdominal pain, fever, leukocytosis, and tachycardia. The elderly patients with chest pain or new onset arrhythmia after gastrectomy must be ruled out anastomosis leakage. The timing of leakage was postoperative 5 to 9 days regardless of site and it could result from systemic risk factors and technical problems. Some article told the leakage within postoperative 4 days could be considered as technical failure. Contrast swallow with non enhanced CT could detect the information on the location and extent of leakage and also useful for a follow-up. Endoscopy has high sensitivity and specificity but could worsen the defect with pressure. CT could detect any correctable intra-abdominal problem. Besides, drain fluid analysis could help the early detection. This figure demonstrates the mainly experimental approaches. Among them are stem cell therapy, individualized bowel preparation, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and induction of the hypoxic adaptive at response, matrix metalloprotease inhibition, cross-factor administration, and anti-inflammatory therapies. To prevent the leakage, surgeon could modify risk factors, use interoperative tests to early detection, and several reinforcement techniques. First, modifying risk factor during perioperative periods is essential. Malnutrition should be corrected and discontinuation of smoking is needed. In addition, minimal steroid usage, power preparation, adequate interval between chemotherapy and surgery, short surgery duration, and anastomotic technique, including limited tension and optimized perfusion should be considered. When surgeons are not sure about the consistency of anastomosis during operation, several techniques could be used. A leak test or leak test using dye, usually methylene blue, could be easily applied during surgery. Some articles recommended interoperative endoscopy could detect any defect or anastomotic problem. Other studies reported that fluorescence angiography or a firefly system with ICG could detect blood supply around anast anastomosis site. Although these interoperative tests are effective for detecting the anastomosis problem, but most of studies fail to show the statistical beneficial effect because they suppose the leakage result from not only correctable technical problem, but also inco incorrectable systemic patient factor. There are many studies to reinforce anastomosis sites. Suture reinforcement, where surgeon did not sure the consistency, could be easily done. 
to add mechanical strength and microbial shielding, fibering glues or fibering patches also could be used, applied. To close the gap between staple, some studies used the bioabsorbable stable line, staple line reinforcement. Moreover, buttressing technique using momentum or mesentery also could be done. To enter a feeding, feeding jejunostomy or nasal jejunal tube positioned at the downstream of the leakage site should be considered. If the leakage is minor or controlled, enteral feeding could be done especially in case of duodenal stump leakage. Somatostatin retinal secretion of gastric acid, gastrin, secretin, cholesterol, tokinin, etc and could be useful in healing. Most leakages could be healed by conservative management. Endoscopic management, radiology intervention, and surgical treatment should be considered when conservative management failed. In the papers, already mentioned, reported the frequency of management methods according to the anastomosis site. In gastroduodenal stomach site leakage, 68% was healed after initial management. About half patient receiving intervention as initial treatment need additional intervention or surgery. Success rate of additional management was 80% 7%. Overall mortality was 6%. In gastrojejunostomy site leakage, less than half was healed after initial management. Over half patient receiving intervention as initial treatment need additional intervention or surgery. Success rate of additional management was 92%. Overall mortality was 11%. In esophago jejunal stomach site leakage, 61% was healed after initial management, 25% receiving conservative management, and over half patients receiving intervention as initial treatment need additional intervention or surgery. Success rate of additional management was 82%. Overall mortality was 11%. Unlike the other site leakage, most of the patients were healed after initial management in duodenal stump leakage. Overall mortality was 2%. Before the confirmation of bacteria, empiric antimicrobial therapy should be done. Carbapenem like meropenem, imipenem, doripenem, or piperacillin tazobactam could be used as single drug regimen. Ceftazidim or cepepim with metronidazole and vancomycin or ampicillin. Vancomycin with metronidazole and acetreonam could also be used as combination regimen. Especially in upper GI leakage, empiric antifungal coverage could be recommended. Most surgeons have tendency to reuse antibiotics to wrong in leakage patients. If adequate source controlled or clinically improved leakage without accumulation, was confirmed, four or five days usage is enough. However, if there are uncontrolled ongoing bowel leak or undrained abscess, antibiotics should be continued. Recent study recommended procalcitonin as inflammatory marker, not ESR, CRP, or WBC, traditionally used. Surgical management could be considered 
If sepsis with organ failure, diffuse peritonitis, or inefficient drainage was going on, primary closure of the leak, feeding jejunostomy or revision of anastomosis site were done but caused a high mortality. So surgery should be proceeded only after other management failed. So, if patient did not complain diffuse peritonitis, conservative treatment could be done and CT was useful to evaluate or follow up the degree of abscess. CT or ultrasound guided drainage should be considered to check the drainable abscess. When conservative treatment fails, endoscopic treatment could be considered in stable patients. However, surgical treatment could be considered in unstable patients or diffuse peritonitis sign. Anastomotic leakage remains one of the most relevant complications following gastric surgery. Surgeons should reduce the modifiable risk factor of leakage and consider the importance of suspicion leading to early diagnosis. Every effort to avoid a surgical management should be done by early antibiotic therapy, nutritional support, and intervention. Thank you for attention. We thank you very much for the informative presentations. From now, we would like to start the question and answer for the first presentation with Dr. Yoon. Dr. Yoon, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, what is the most important factor make you decide to re-operation? Oh, yes. Uh, I think a surgeon, uh... Adequate blood supply and uh, adequate tension near uh, an osmosis site is most important, I think. But uh, we cannot uh, neglect other systemic factor, uh, as I said. So, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. I would like to introduce the second speaker. The second speaker is Professor Junchal Park from Yonsei University, Korea. To introduce him, he graduated Yonsei University in 2003 and now works at Severance Hospital as an associate professor and published many scientific publications. Please stream the second speaker's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is my great honor to present uh, this kind of topic uh, at this wonderful symposium. Uh, so today my talk is uh, about endoscopic stent insertion for management of uh, leakage after uh, surgical uh, resection. GI leak is one of the most dreaded complications with significant uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, surgical repair is also difficult due to uh, mark altered anatomy, uh, post up surgical cases, and developing adhesion and inflammation. So, endoscopic approaches have some advantages like minimally invasive procedure, and many are not affected by the condition of leak edges or reduce the need for prolonged parental nutrition and hospital stay. But, endoscopic management of GI leak is uh, usually highly demanding technically because of a uh, a uh, very narrow room in, in uh, managing with endoscopy and very poor accessibility like because of a sharp angle and narrow space. So expertise of management is necessary when you're making a decision. So when to intervene or choice of endoscopy method, and assessment of radiological findings before and after endoscopy procedures and we have to know the uh, detailed knowledge of a different uh, post-surgical anatomies. Until now, studies on endoscopic approaches have generally reported favorable results, but 
there is still lack of large prospective and randomized studies. That means uh, the most of studies are very have uh, many uh, sele selection bias, so we have to cautiously interpret that kind of the uh, uh, this kind of the uh, study field. So I'm going to introduce some kind of uh, endoscopic uh, approach for using clips and main topic of the stent, and some case of uh, using PJ uh, felt, and last evac system is a more uh, introduced. Uh, next speaker will introduce more detail about the evac system. Stent is the, the most studied endoscopic technique in leak management, preventing infection and creating a more stable environment, minimizing the risk of stricture and falsely interfeeding. But stent has a the major has this uh, limitation like stent migration. So uh, I usually use the sim stent like this stent is a. A proximal lasso is a brought uh, out of the nostril and loop around the earlobe, so that may prevent migration. So I'm going to show some cases using this kind of a uh, stent method. The first case, a uh, eight years old male, uh, he was underwent a uh, subtotal a uh, radical uh, subtotal gastrectomy. And after all, several days, the symptom the patient has a symptom for fever or and uh, inflammation and the CT scan show that there's some uh, leakage around anastomosite. When I performed endoscopy, you can show that there's a very big defect around the anastomos area and also you can see that this kind of a surgical material. So I decide to insert the stand uh, using a uh, SIMS uh, technique and after uh, two weeks later I just checked the, the stand uh, position and you can see the uh, lat, uh, string here for, uh, for ma uh, pre ma preventing uh, migration. After six weeks later uh, I decide to remove the stand so uh, this, this picture shows the, the before I uh, removing the stand. After I remove the stand, you can see the very well uh, healing ulceration uh, in the uh, previous uh, leakage site here. So you can compare with a big difference between the before and after the stand remover. And second case is also uh, the uh, total gastrectomy because of the, due to the old gas cancer, 65 years old male. And CT scan show the very, uh, there's a leakage here around the anastomos anastomos side. So the endoscopy show that there, uh, there's also about two centimeter uh, defect hole here around the anastomos side. So I insert the uh, SIMS uh, technique for full cover stand here and you can see the string uh, to make a uh, to prevent migration after uh, four four weeks later i checked endoscopy uh, the stand was well positioned here but there's some uh, ulceration of the proximal edge of the stand so that's why we have to uh, check the endoscopy uh, after insert the stand after four or four between between four to eight weeks, and and after stand remover there's some bleeding. Usually after remove stand there's some mild oozing bleeding, but usually this kind of bleeding stops spontaneously, and the edge of the proximal. Uh, stent area has an ulceration, but there is no uh, uh, perforation or very or deep uh, uh, laceration. And you can, uh, and there is a previous uh, defect here, and there is well uh, healed reactively ligation. And you can check the very big difference between the previous uh, endoscopy picture. And fourth case is a male, 43 years old male. He, he, he has a Bohevar syndrome. So primary repair of a rupture as fungus was done. But after surgery, there is a, a leakage here. 
so I insert the stand, but uh, the two days later, the only migration occurred, so I just changed the stand with Sims technique, and after uh, four weeks later, the, the defect was healed with re -application. And another case is a, a, 70, a 74 years old male, and he was underwent total gastric for uh, due to the oligase cancer. And you can see that after surgery, there's some um, uh, leakage here uh, around the anastomosis anastom site. And endoscopy uh, shows that there of, uh, there's a big uh, defect around the anastomosis site, so I insert a, a full cover stand. And the stand was well positioned about uh, six weeks, but there's a late migration after six like six weeks later. So I just removed the migration stand, and you can see there's a, a well uh, healing ulceration, but there's some still uh, defect, and I have to uh, insert another uh, stand with full uh, Sims technique. After three weeks later, uh, I just removed the previous stand. There's no migration. And you can check the, the well healed the previous uh, leakage site. And this case shows uh, the long time for, for because of the migration and total time is nine weeks, but the, the final result is very good. So as far as your stand outcome usually shows a clinical success rate at 85% and functional ceiling of population is 70 to 100% and most patients are able to eat after uh, three couple of days and all stem easily uh, removed after six to eight weeks so uh, we have to check out the stent uh, condition uh, after one month later and stand migration rate shows a uh, up to 30% and over mortality rate is 15%. And another uh, the migration, anti migration stat is a, a Nitis uh, beta stand manufactured by Taehyung. You can see that uh, the alter or different design compared to previous stand, like there's a two areas uh, making a, a silicone covered double layer to make a prevent a risk of migration. And previous, uh, recently there's some study for, um, for checking the safety and feasibility for using this kind of stent for uh, managing of a leakage or fistula after surgery. Second case is a 59 years old male. He was underwent subtotal asphyxectomy due to asphyxic cancer. You can see the very dirty wound area, uh, I mean anastomosis area and also the fluoroscope uh, you can see there is a defect here and usually in this kind of uh, asphagia cancer case uh, sometimes it's very hard to positioning of the stent because the just beneath of the upper asphagia sphincter here so there's very narrow uh, space to uh, locate the proximal of uh, the stand, so we have to handle more delicate to using this kind of stand, this kind of the uh, uh, situation. After three months later, uh, this kind of a little bit more longer duration of the stand uh, due to other uh, factor, I think. And when we check the endoscopy, the proximal of the uh, asphagus site has a uh, structures so you can see the, the just above the stent proximal stent I have to balloon dilatation of this kind of uh, uh, this area so after balloon dilatation the proximal edge of the stent is uh, located here and this uh, three months is a little bit longer than one or two months so that's why the proximal of the stent location is a very deep ulceration so this might can make a perforation, so we have to carefully look up the after move the stand. So I just removed the stand, and uh, but the, the distal part is very uh, fine. And after I remove the stand, there are very deep ulceration with bleeding. But when we check out the fluoroscope, there's no defect or uh, leakage, so I uh, just 
successful remove the stand. Even if uh, the high rate of a successful rate of using the stand for uh, managing of a leakage, but there is uh, some limitation for for stand like early or late migration. Even if we use uh, anti-migration stand, and another is a very large side effect and and like some subtotal gastrectomy we cannot make perfect cover by only the stand so i'm going to show some another uh using another method so this kid is a six or seven years old male he was underwent uh, proximate gastrectomy due to all gas cancer and after uh leakage i insert the sense technique stand here around the anosmo side and there's a well uh, you can see that the well positioning of the stand here and after six weeks later i removed the stand there's some uh, oozing but spontaneous stopped uh, but there's still a very deep uh wound site for uh leakage i mean a fistula here so i decided it's, it's very hard to handle this kind of stand so i make a, a evac system for for managing the kind of suction uh vacuum endoscope treatment and after insert the evac system uh, and i remove the evac system sponge here and only two weeks two weeks later the the wound site was well healed and if there's no leakage using the contrast and after uh, several months later, there is very old heel ulceration here. Now, another case is also a uh, very old age male. He was underwent subtotal uh, gastrectomy due to old gastric cancer, and the CD scan shows a very, very defect here uh, around the anastomosis site. So, this case is subtotal gastrectomy, but I first I decided to insert a, a Sims technique stand here, and uh, this picture shows a well positioning of the stand. After 12 days, uh, I decided to remove the stand because this, the patient has a high uh, sustained fever and high, high rate of uh, leukocytosis. So I thought, I, just, I thought this kind of a situation in like subtotal gastronomy is the, the like, like big size of a defect. There is no, uh, there is a limitation for using only the stand. So, after I remove the stand, you can see the old, still the dirty wound uh, around the uh, uh, defect area. So I decided to insert a uh, sponge, uh, like negative pressure for evac system, and I insert uh, this in the, this defect with the alligator for uh, sponge to the to the this, uh, intracavity area and well positioned the picture. You can see the very very a clean uh, site after one week later. After two weeks later, the patient, the condition well uh, improved, so and there's no fevers, so I decided to remove the uh, evac system, and you can, uh, this is uh, uh, the motion uh, clip, and after just move, after the move the sponge here, you can see the very well healing re with without uh, leakage. So this case also uh, shows only two weeks for uh, complete healing for its kind of very deep uh, uh, defect here. So which is better, stent or effect system? So I try to compare, compare this kind of two modality for managing of uh, the anosmic leak in gastric cancer. So I, we, study for the, about uh, 10 years uh, there's some um, 39 cases of asthma leak uh, due to gastric cancer so 28 patient uh, SAMS only and 7 patient was uh, evac following after SAMS failure and 4 patient uh, initially treated with evac only so uh, this, is, this study is a very small sample size but uh, we can uh, find them some uh, the adv advantage of the two modality and there's the, no big difference between two groups especially the leaky side is a more a large side like using evac and compared to uh, stent group and the 
The third outcome shows that success of closer is a totally 95%, and EBEX is the 100%, and SAMS was uh, about 20, uh, 93%, but there's no uh, difference. And duration of therapy has a significant difference uh, between two groups, and EBEC is a median follow-up duration of 15, like about two weeks, and stand about one month. And interesting, interesting uh, factor is an uh, antibody setup. Uh, because after insert the EVAC, there is no uh, antibody setup cases. But even if the insert the stent, there is some sustained inflammation or infection. So that's why the uh, 40 about 40 percent has an uh, antibody setup. And we have a uh, a five case of a uh, stricture, and four of them was stent case, and one is a uh, conversion stent to EVAC cases. So uh, this study can, sh can uh, make a conclusion that stems has advantages such as convert convenience of a procedure, the ability to sp supply nutrition after procedure, and shortening the hospitalization period. And EVAC may be another useful treatment option for both initial treatment, treatment or an SAMS failure in anosmic leakage after gastrectomy. But the largest random and controlled trials are needed to confirm the efficacy of EVAC. And lastly, I'm going to do some using another modality using PGA sheet. Uh, you know that is a familiar with the surgeon because the surgical material. And uh, this case is a, is a 56 year old male. He was uh, underwent subtotal gastrectomy, and, but after the surgery, there is a small leakage here. And uh, first, uh, I tried to manage with clip because they're very small, small uh, leakage, but there is some. A uh, limitation we're using is cliff because there's very dematis around the area. And after one week later, I checked endoscopy and there all the previous stent was removed. So I decided to make a, a compact this uh, defect with a PJ with a clipping with a PJ with around the tissue area and using the histoacry glue. And after uh, 20, 20 days later, I just bought an endoscopy and the leakage was all, all healed. And the second case is an 89 years old male. He was underwent colon cancer, uh, laparoscopy, right, help, collect, right hemicolectomy. And after this, uh, surgery, there is a duodenal uh, defect here, maybe some uh, injury of the, uh, during the surgery. Then you can see the very large, relatively large defect around the uh, uh, duodenal area, so uh, I decided to using a clip. But after what we later, the clip, all the clip go into the retroperitoneal area. So you, usually the, uh, the duodenal side is very hard to manage because the wall is very deep, they're very thin, and the, the manu uh, managing maneuverability of the endoscope is very hard to man uh, handling. And there's a retro pattern errors also make some difficult to manage. So I decide to make a uh, control, uh, I mean, uh, manage this kind of a leak site with a PGA. So you can see the, the mo uh, motion clip here. Uh, and I insert the PGA around the defect area and make a clip with the, uh, the edge of the uh, PGA shape. So, and after follow-up endoscopy, there is a well uh, healing ulceration around uh, the defect area. Well, let me summarize uh, today's talk. So, endoscopy management of leakage is uh, highly demanding technically. And we can use a clip, but the clip has uh, many limitations for the size of leakage or, and a weak superficial grasp and need sufficient space for deployment. And we can use the STEN, the most studied endoscopy technique in leak management, but there are some limitations like stent migration and ulceration of the uh, proximal uh, edges of a stent. And the size also is a limitation for, for managing uh, the stent, some selected cases. So to overcome the limitation of a stent, so new endoscopy management like EVAC system or using PZA, and the technology should be developed and researched.
Thank you for your kind attention. We thank you very much for the presentations. From now, we would like to start the question and answer time for the second presentation with Dr. Bach. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Bach from uh, Han Mo Yun. Uh, do you have experience of structure after stent management? If you have, what is your opinion to prevent these complications? and to resolve this problem? Yes, uh, I already showed uh, in the uh, lecture that I have several uh, experience of a uh, stricture, but mostly the search after leakage and, and developed stricture shows very um, narrow stricture. So we can manage several times of balloon dilatation. So uh, in personal uh, ex uh, experience, I don't need I don't do any uh, prevention method like uh, or uh, uh, steroid or injection steroid. So usually that kind of stricture can manage several times of balloon dilatation. But but most cases uh, the stricture comes from uh, esophageal cases like esophagectomy, something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is there any difference result of stent insertion between malignant surgery case and benign surgery case? Oh, uh, that's very, very good question. <laughs> uh, some most most cases of a uh, stricture I have experienced for for, for malignant case usually after total gastrectomy for cancer for or aspergic cancer. But sometimes some like Boerhaver syndrome like and after another part of a surgical resection, there's some uh, perforation for duodenum. There's but I don't think there's much difference, but there's a difference between the organ, like asparagus or, uh, I mean, uh, duodenal stom stomach, there's some difference between the organ. But I don't think after the surgery, uh, there's not much difference, but it's my, only my personal experience. Uh, thank you. Thank you. A uh, professor like you, Dr. Junchol Bak, next to a surgeon, will be a great help. Oh, yeah. another. Here is another question uh, from Professor Chang Mogang. Comparing with assistant surgeon camera holding, how about time lag between surgeon's intention and robotic movements? Oh, I'm not sure. This, this is, is not, not, not. Yeah. This yeah, is not. Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Question, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, by the way. Now, I will hand over my authority to Dr. An. She will, from now on, take care of the remaining session. Please, Dr. An. Thank you, Dr. Bae. Mm -hmm. So, I will introduce the third speaker. He is a Professor Yang Won Min from Samsung Medical Center, Songjinga University. Uh, he's an uh, excellent endoscopist. Yeah. Uh, he will give a lecture on endoscopic vacuum therapy. And now, and please start the video. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm an endoscopist from the Samsung Medical Center. Today, I will talk about endoscopy vacuum therapy for post op anastomotic leakage with some cases review and our data. I have nothing to declare. After eyeball race operation for esophageal cancer, anastomotic leakage was developed. Eight days after operation, fever developed and anastomotic leak was confirmed endoscopically. Leak persisted after 19 days conservative management and endoscopic vacuum treatment was applied. Through the esophageal defect, 3cm sized wound cavity was noticed. After introducing spongy into the stomach, it can be inserted into the wound cavity using a grasping forceps. You have to remove the endoscopy, ribbing, tube, 
at the proper location. Lastly, you should check whether the tube is twisted in the oral cavity or not. 11 days after treatment, significantly reduced cavity size with the development of granulation tissue was noticed and therapy finished. The sponge was exchanged twice for effective drain and stimulation of granulation without adhesion in the cavity during therapy. Next case. Five days after ivory operation, anastomotic leakage was detected endoscopically. And three days later, endoscopy vacuum treatment was applied. Just below the anastomosis, one centimeter sized wound cavity was noticed. Because the size of cavity opening was small, only four days after therapy, wound cavity reduced with granulation tissue growth. Thus, no more endoscope vacuum therapy was necessary. Next case. Six days after ivory operation, endoscopy vacuum treatment was applied for anastomotic leakage. Like this case, when the size of leak cavity is large, it takes longer time to achieve complete healing. At first, the cavity size was more than 5 cm. Within the first two weeks, wound cavity and patient's general condition was stabilized. One month later, the wound cavity was completely healed. Similarly, also in cases of anastomotic leakage following gastrectomy, endoscopy vacuum treatment can be applied. This patient visited ER due to fever and abdominal pain and CT scan showed anastomotic leakage findings. Anastomotic leakage was confirmed endoscopically and the endoscopic vacuum treatment was applied. Three days later, leakage was improved. One week later, anastomotic leakage was completely healed. Although during endoscopic vacuum treatment, MPO was necessary, but period of treatment seemed to be shortened compared to the other option like covered stent insertion. Among the several anastomotic complications after esophagectomy, leak is the most common and serious, and the incidence ranges from 3% to 25%. After esophagectomy, the incidence of anastomotic leakage is higher in the cervical anastomosis than in the intrathoracic anastomosis. Esophageal anastomotic leak following esophagectomy is associated with a three times higher death risk than for patients without anastomotic leakage. Prolonged spillover of gastric contents, including digestive enzyme, bacteria, and bile, into the mediastinum, combined with constant mediastinal movement with respiration and negative intrathoracic pressure sucking the contents outward contributes to the high mortality rate. The treatment of anastomotic leak remains controversial as the indications for surgical, conservative, and endoscopic therapy remains non-standardized. The two predominant therapeutic options include primary surgical intervention and covered stent insertion. Immediate detection and prompt sealing the leakage are of vital importance to prevent further damage. In addition, 
draining any collection at the anastomosis is necessary to control infection. In a systemic review, endoscopic stent insertion for the management of anastomotic leak was successful in 72% of patients. However, overall mortality was 15%. The average time for stenting is 6 to 8 weeks. Stent-related complications occurred in 34% of patients, which includes migration, bleeding, perforation, and tissue ingrowth. In general, endoscopic stenting is limited to leaks involving less than 30% of the anastomotic leak circumferences and without extensive necrosis of the gastric conduit. Taken together, stenting for esophageal anastomotic leak is potentially beneficial, but not without significant potential risk. A new alternative method, endoscopy vacuum assisted closure, consists of the endoscopy insertion of polyurethane sponges into the abscess cavity induced by the leak followed by application of a controlled continuous negative pressure. The vacuum removes wound secretions, reduces edema, and therefore improves blood flow, and the use of sponge leads to formation of granulation teeth. This results in a clean wound base and improves subsequent wound closure. I'll show you endoscopy vacuum treatment procedure. After assessing the leak about the size and location, Revin tube is inserted via the nose and brought out through the mouth. Spongy is sutured to the tip of the tube and inserted into the cavity using grasping forceps. When cavity size is fully reduced with granulation tissue, endoscopy vacuum treatment could discontinue. As I said before, tube is inserted by the nose and brought out through the mouth. And you need to cut the distal part of the tube, leaving no side hole. However, depending on the situation, you could leave one or two side holes. Next, polyurethane sponge is sutured to the tip of the tube, covering holes. Trimming of the sponge is required according to the size of cavity. The sponge size is needed to be smaller than the wound cavity to promote collapse. In a German retrospective study, outcomes of patients who were treated with stent or endoscopic vacuum treatment for intrathoracic leak were compared. The overall closure rate was significantly higher in the endoscopic vacuum treatment group than in the stent group. Endoscopic vacuum treatment was successful in 85%. In addition, less structure developed in the vacuum treatment group than in the stent group. Recent, another German retrospective study analyzed 45 patients with endoscopic leaks following esophagectomy who received either stent or endoscopic vacuum treatment. As you can see here, seven patients of the stent group were switched to endoscopy vacuum treatment and four patients to surgery. According to the initial treatment, the success rate was higher in the endoscopy vacuum treatment group than in the stent group. When classified by final 
the success rate was higher in the endoscopy vacuum treatment group in the stent group with marginal statistical significance. Therefore, endoscopy vacuum treatment could be more effective than stenting for treating intrathoracic anastomotic leakage. We also analyzed the initial 20 cases in the Samsung Medical Center between October 2016 and December 2017. Using a homogeneous group of patients with esophageal anastomotic leakage following esophagectomy for esophageal cancer. We aimed to evaluate the efficacy and safety of endoscopy vacuum treatment and identify factors associated with treatment failure and treatment duration with endoscopy vacuum treatment. Endoscopy vacuum treatment started at a median three days after leak detection. Median duration of endoscopy vacuum treatment was 14.5 days and a median number of required intervention was five times. 19 patients, 95% of patients were successfully treated and one case, 5% of patients with a large leak was unsuccessful with endoscopic vacuum treatment and the patient died. After endoscopic vacuum treatment, 7 patients, 35% of patients developed anastomotic stricture after treatment. Because we have only one treatment failure case, we could not identify the prognostic factor for failure. Instead, we investigated the factors associated with the long duration of endoscopy vacuum treatment. As you can see here, longer endoscopy vacuum treatment was required in patient who received neodymium treatment. In addition, fistula size was associated with the treatment duration with marginal statistical significance. Now, I will summarize and conclude today's presentation. Endoscopic treatment is effective for post-operative anastomotic leakage after esophagectomy for cancer. Nonetheless, longer treatment duration may be required for patients who receive neodymium treatment and have large leakage openings. Early detection and prompt treatment could improve the clinical outcomes of those patients. Endoscopy vacuum treatment also could be used for anastomotic leakage following gastrectomy, especially uh, total gastrectomy rather than subtotal gastrectomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your nice and impressive presentation. Uh, there is one uh, question from Dr. Dalayan Ganyasan. Uh, uh, I would like to ask what you, what are your uh, criteria for choosing which patient would benefit from endoscopic vacuum treatment and which group of patient wouldn't? Please answer, Dr. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's very important to question. I think the benefit of endoscopic vacuum treatment uh, compared to stenting is the continuous negative pressure, which could uh, uh, counteract against negative pressure intrathoracic uh, 
a circumference which could uh, make the favorable outcome for the infection control. So uh, I decided to do endoscopic vacuum treatment for intrathoracic leakage cases. And some cases of total gas, after total gastrectomy, uh, there is some evidence of intrathoracic complication like uh, pleural effusion. But uh, uh, in some total gastrectomy, this is not uh, much beneficial than the intra compared to intrathoracic uh, leakage treatment. So when there is a leakage after aspartectomy, your uh, first treatment option is vacuum therapy rather than endoscopic stent. Is it right? In your case. Yes. Um, the benefit of uh, stenting is uh, the patient can eat during treatment, but required a uh, longer treatment than uh, vacuum treatment. But it's for their cancer leak the uh, patient to have uh, severe um, mm, have um, the 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 anastomosis of aspartectomy is higher so the location is very difficult to to position the stenting without movement although the professor Park showed the same technique but patient very uncomfortable with uh, stenting. And also intrathoracic leakage uh, has a very poor circumstance with uh, uh, spreading infection due to negative pressure intrathoracic. So I think intrathoracic leakage problem, uh, the endoscopic treatment is much uh, efficacy than the other treatment like stenting. But the patient have a nasogastric tube during the vacuum treatment. Is it tolerable for patient? Of course, it's very, some case very, uh, say it's very uncomfortable. And so also the patient should uh, avoid eating during mm -hmm. treatment. But uh, the, the period of the treatment, I think we, could be shortened with endoscopic vacuum treatment. Mm -hmm. So I do not usually perform uh, vacuum treatment for uh, usual uh, uh, leakage after gastrectomy or mm -hmm. subtotal gastrectomy. Mm -hmm. So I selected to the patient like uh, leakage after aspartectomy, I mm -hmm. perform the vacuum treatment. Thank you. Uh... There is another question. Dr. Sanghyun Kim, have you ever experienced vacuum therapy after bariatric surgery? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I do not have any experience of treatment after bariatric surgery. Okay. okay, thank you. Due to the time limit, we will move to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last speaker is Professor Jong Seok Ho. He is a radiologist of the Catholic University in Korea. Uh, he, he will give a lecture for the radiology intervention for treating upper GI tract leakage. Uh, but he is not here uh, with us. Uh, please, please start the video. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to invite me to this conference as a speaker. I'm Jung so Go, interventional radiologist, and while I worked in Seoul St. Mary's Hospital. Today, I will introduce interventional treatment option and my experience for treatment of upper GI tract leakage. Most of my experience was the treatment for the duodenal stump leakage. Post duodenal stump leakage is most serious and troublesome complication and main cause of death. The rate of disruption is 1 to 6 percent. The mortality of stump leakage is 3 to 5 percent despite the development of surgical techniques. Traditionally, treatment options for GI tract leakage can be divided as three categories. 
first reoperation and second endoscopic treatment as a simple drainage with antibiotics and nutritional support. However, in many cases, reoperation can be not effective due to postoperative edema, inflammation, and dense adhesion. In simple drainage method, fistula tract would be closed spontaneously within two week, two or three weeks. Thus, it needs to long hospital stay. Also, unfortunately, in many cases, trauma formation is impossible due to postoperative inflammation, shortening of mesentery, peritoneal carcinomatosis, obesity, or dense adhesion. Goals of management of stump liquid is to create a controlled fistula to skin and prevent liquids of biliary and pancreatic secretion. In this respect, Foley catheter insertion can be an effective method to close the opening and the formation of controlled fistula tract. This is an illustration of our procedure. When a deodorant stump liquid is found, a pigtail catheter is inserted at firstly under the guidance of ultrasound, combium CT, or throat a JP tube, and then tubography is performed. If fistula tract to the bowel is visible, we can insert Foley catheter immediately. However, in most cases, the fistula tract is not visible. Thus, we have to take a time about one week for maturation. After accumulated fluid and inflammation are reduced, Foley catheter is inserted. With a reduction in accumulated fluid and the maturation of fistula tract, it is much easier to locate the fistula tract. Goals of Foley catheter drainage can be summarized as three things. First, to create a controlled fistula into the skin so as to control for the contamination. Second, to enable enteral feeding as soon as possible so as to promote healing of the fistula. And last, to restore the patient's normal daily, daily life as soon as possible. This is a case. First case is 64 male patients underwent bilus 2 subtotal gastrectomy for treatment of gastric cancer. This is a CT scan after 9 post operative days. We can see the fluid collection at the odorous stump and let's set. This is a post operative deodorant stop leakage and we plan to drain this fluid. In many cases, it's hard to determine access route because of overlying bowel, long, long shadow, and diaphragm. The transhepatic approach is the best, but it's not easy to find fluid collection on ultrasound because it is too deep. In this case, combium CT guidance is helpful to determine approach route. This patient underwent combium CT guidance and we performed successful pigtail catheter insertion to leakage site. Immediate tubography shows no fistula tract. We have to take a time for reduction of fluid inflammation and edema. After one week, Follow-up tubography was performed through the indwelling drainage catheter. Controlled fistula tract is seen, which was not visible one week ago. Poly catheter was inserted of the guide wire and the balloon was dilated for fixing. 
and final geography is performed through the follicatheta in order to determine the correct position of the follicatheta. Patients start oral intake after two days and discharged at seven days after procedure. After one month, follicatheta was removed in our patient clinic without complication. Second case, 65 male underwent complete total gastrectomy and wrong eye reconstruction due to recurrent gastric cancer. Fluoroscopic examination shows contrast leakage at the esophageal jejunostomy site. We can see the fluid collection around the spleen in axial CT scan. This case is also hard to approach because of overlying flora, underlying parenchyma, and diaphragm. Thus, Combim CT guided approach was done. We planned combination treatment in this case, such as obsessed drainage plus endoscopic GI stent insertion. Immediately after drainage catheter insertion, patients underwent endoscopic GI stent insertion. However, two days after endoscopic GI stent insertion, follow-up radiograph shows stent migration like this. We reinsert GI stent three times more, but stent migration was repeated. Finally, we decide percutaneous polycatheter insertion. This is a tubography by an indwelling catheter shows controlled fistula tract. The migrate stent was endoscopically removed. After tract dilatation using a volume catheter, 10 French Foley catheter was successfully placed. This is a one month follow-up image after fully cut the removal. We can see the complete regression of obsessed pocket and no more leakage. Third case, 60 old male suffered from pancreatic head cancer and ruptured GB. Note that this case is our failed case for treatment with catheter, We can see the large pancreatic head cancer, also contrast passage between ruptured GB and duodenal second portion. Under ultrasound guidance, we assess the ruptured GB and tubography shows contrast passage into the duodenal second portion. Like this case, if fistula tract is visible on immediate tubography, we can proceed to insert Foley catheter directly. We successfully insert 12 French Foley catheter into the duodenum. After one week, plain radiograph shows migrated Foley catheter. Does catheter exchange was performed into the correct position. After two weeks, catheter migration was again noted and second reposition was performed. One week later, we found that fully catheter was withdrawn again and we gave up reinsertion and just keep the drainage catheter into the ruptured GB and plan to endoscopic GI stent insertion. However, the patient died a few days later due to distortion of general condition. This case was a failed case of fully catheter management. This is our flow chart after procedure. On procedure day, 
close observation overnight without oral intake. If there is no sign of symptom of peritonitis, we start oral intake with a sip of water. And if tolerable, start a regular diet. If discharge through the folic uh, catheter decreases for more than two days, folic catheter clamp and patient discharge. If, if follow-up CT scan shows no more obsessed cavity or no neural developed, developed symptoms, folic catheter removal was performed in our patient clinic. This is our preliminary results for 10 patients underwent folic catheter insertion due to duodenal stump leakage. Only duodenal stump leakage patients are included in our preliminary study. Duodenal stump leakage was diagnosed average 10 days after surgery and first drainage catheter insertion was performed immediately after 9 days we exchange to 10 to 12 French folic catheter. Average is seven days after folic catheter insertion, patients were discharged and removed folic catheter after one month in our patient clinic. Folic catheter insertion has some advantages compared to simple drainage. First, by blocking the opening, we can prevent additional leakage and patients can do early oral intake. Second, because early oral intake improves patient recovery, it reduces patient hospital stay and catheter indwelling time. This is our experience for treatment of GI leakage with folic catheter insertion. More than 32 patients were treated and there were various causes of leakage such as benign malignant condition and post-operative or indirect surgical complications. From our data review, we got the following results. Systemic comorbidity and successful oral intake after folic catheter placement are significant factors for the clinical success. Systemic comorbidity included in our study were Bassett and Crohn's disease, diffuse soft tissue sarcoma, and carcinomatosis peritonei. From our experience, there are some limitations for treatment with folic catheter of GRE kids. Chronic inflammatory conditions such as followings usually interrupt the close of stump opening. These are poor prone spectra. Thus, our recommendation for successful treatment using folic catheter is that sufficient length of time is needed for pigdale catheter drainage before folic catheter insertion to reduce post-operative inflammation and edema. And second, the removal time of folic catheter must be carefully determined. The folic catheter should be removed only after the enterocutaneous fistula tract has completely matured so that the duodenal stump opening and fistula tract can be completely closed without intraperitoneal leakage. However, in patients with systemic comorbidity, the removal time of the folic catheter should be delayed and other and another treatment such as adjuvant chemotherapy or reposition should be considered. And smaller diameter folic catheter is good to promote all healing of the fistula tract. 
is summary. Foley catheter insertion is the effective and safe treatment option for postoperative upper joint tract leakage. However, it needs to establish the standard protocol for pigtail drainage duration and enduring time of Foley catheter and hospitalization period. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, because the duodenal stump is uh, very difficult to approach by endoscopic uh, endoscope, so the radiology intervention looks, looks very helpful when conservative management failed. Uh, so it's very interesting. But Dr. O is not, uh, he, he can't attend the uh, open Q&A session. Uh, we cannot discuss about about his procedures uh, with him. So, uh, due to the time limit, we should move to the next next session. So, uh, I would like to close this session now. Uh, thank you, all audiences and lecturers and chairmen. Thank you. <laughs>